Okay, so so we need to write, you know, we're, we want to be adding rules, right? So we could either, if you want, we can add to this. So you want like another grammar rule, like another left-hand side, P? Okay. P, okay. Uh-huh. So you said e comma e, and then zero here, and then what else? E comma e one. Okay. So yeah, well hold on, hold on. So first of all, thank you very much for for putting the solution up there. Uh, whenever we're doing solutions, it's always a, we're sort of brainstorming. And oftentimes you might not get the right thing right away, but by staring at it, we can then sort of like try to check to see if it covers all the cases. And it looks like there's already an aha going on back there about maybe it doesn't cover all the cases. Do you see an example up here where it doesn't match? Or so does it or here? Yeah. Does anyone see a counterexample? Yeah, yeah, so this 5, 2 plus 4, that pair there, there's no subscript there, right? So the subscripting isn't, doesn't have to happen right away, right? So, so we really don't want these uh, with the subscript sort of built in, right? Um, and, in, right? and in some sense, what's going on here is that we're sort of, when you're, when you're building these grammars, you want to have one rule per sort of, syntactic thing and not try to mix two things together. So here we're sort of mixing the formation of a pair with the accessing of elements out of a pair. And we, those are two different actions, right? And like if, it, if this was like object oriented or something, it'd be like there'd be a constructor and then it's like method calls and you wouldn't want to put those together, right? So, right, so let's, let's not do that, okay? So also uh, we're not gonna need any other other left-hand sides, like P's or anything. We can just stick with E's, okay? But how about let's go with another, thank you very much. I think that helps us move forward, and I, I bet a lot of other people were thinking along similar lines. Um, all right, let's get a new, new, new. I have uh, another thing, so bar E comma E or bar E or something. So you said bar E comma E, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna put, explicit parentheses around that um, because um, these are different parentheses than the ones that you put in for, uh, f for precedence, okay? The, the mathematical convention is that you always really put these parentheses in for pairs. Okay, and then your other one was E with, and what is this subscript? What's that? Ooh, that's exciting. <laughs> I like that. I I was not going to do that. That's cool. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Let's keep that. Why not? Yeah. Can you add them though? Can you add pairs? Because if, if pair of e, e is an expression, you have e plus e in the same grammar. Does that work? N probably not. And that's why we're that's why we're going to need a type system. Oh. Okay. So, so the, what's going on here is that there's really, in some sense, the syntax and the type system work together to sort of say what programs are good. Uh, and um, and then we're going to each sort of let what it does well sort of focus on just that. And so type systems are really good at sort of like, if you need sort of contextual knowledge about what is going to be well formed, you know, what's a good program or not, if you need to know context, then we're going to do it in a type system. If you don't need to know context, then we can do it in a, in a uh, context-free grammar, <laughs> which is what, another name for these things. Uh, OK, cool. I like that. I was going to put an N here, or, or even a 0, and then another one with a 1. But uh, that's, that's kind of exciting. I like that. Uh, uh, oh, so we can use either the subscript. 
Well, you're defining the language. It's your language. <laughs> it, it seems like we quickly run into a case where this doesn't isn't coherent. If we had, say, three subscripts. Uh, yeah. Pairing. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And this is again, this is the type system stuff, right? Like this might be like some million line program down here on this subscript, <laughs> and hopefully it returns a zero or a one, right? But it might not. I, I, I actually then let me just ask a question about the grammar of the. Uh, the PL style syntax. Uh huh. Uh, it's just that um, when we define the uh, what do we call it the, the syntactical rule mm -hmm. of E. Right. So this one down here. Yeah. So we define yep. E. Um, uh, what are the limitations of that, or the or what or the or or could we define that negatively? Uh, to say what are the limitations of that, but I, I don't want to. So what's the limitations of a context-free grammar, like yeah. one of these? Yeah. But I think I would only, the only thing I really have to say is that what I just said was that, you know, you can't use context to, so. I see. Okay. For types, for types. Yeah. Okay. But, but we'll, we're, we're going to dive into types next. Okay. Let's, let's, let's just, let's go dive in because you're all itching. You're all itching. Oh, I'm going to make you wait. Sorry. <laughs> We're going to go do operational semantics first, and then we're going to do type systems. Okay, that's because I'm from Indiana. If, if instead Rob, uh, Bob, sorry, Rob, Bob Harper was here from CMU, he would do the type system first and then the operational semantics. Okay, uh, and he'd be very upset right now. <laughs> but that's okay. But Matthias Fleissen likes it this way, who's the other very. Uh, 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 vocal uh, senior member of our community, and so. Have you seen he has like rants on YouTube? Like somebody made Who's? Of Bob Hopper, oh, that's. Did, did he have a rant about this? Um, just about like um, people following trends as opposed to confusive science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so enough of that. Let's just dive in. Um, so, right, and operational semantics is all about defining the meaning of a program by saying what happens when you run it. Actually, so a little story here. So I'm always continuously amazed at how like programming language standards committees, like I was on the C++ standards committee, and I'm sure this happens in other standards committees, people will argue for hours and hours and hours about the syntax, and then say nothing whatsoever about the semantics, about what happens when you run a thing, as if it was obvious. Yeah. Um, so no, I mean this actually this is like the most important thing is like what happens when you run uh, run the program, okay? And uh, there's many uh, styles of operational semantics. I'm going to uh, go over two of them: big step semantics and small step semantics. Um, there's there's and, and besides operational, there's other kinds of semantics like denotational, and that's what yesterday's talk was all uh, our workshop was all about. Um, if you open up a popple paper these days, it's more likely going to have an operational semantics in it and not denotational. But I'm, I'm hoping to change that actually in the future. So get back to denotational. All right. All right. So what is a big step semantics? It's just a relation between your programs, like a RIF pair, and the result value. Okay. Actually, let's for now let's just stick to a RIF, okay? So the result of a, an ARIF program, we get to decide what that is, what that's going to be. Let's decide that it'll be an integer, okay? <laughs> that was an easy decision because the language was so simple, but it doesn't. It's not always that easy to make decisions about what the value should be, okay? So here, so here we've got this relation. I'm calling it eval. It's a relation between a RIF, things in a RIF, and integers. And, and it's just a relation, but we're going to come up with a funny notation for membership in the relation. Okay, we're going to use this down arrow. Sometimes people like to use double right arrows. But either way, it's going to be a big step semantics, and it's just a relation. Okay, so we're going to write E down arrow N when the pair EN is in the relation. Okay? And now we're going to, we're going to write down, we're going to do yet another definition by rules. Okay? So how many times, this is now our second use of definition by rules. 
Got the same old horizontal lines. So what is this saying? That if you have a pair n comma n, right? It's just you've got some literal integer sitting there, then it's its own result, right? The number 42 is your program. The result is 42. Woohoo! All right. Here's the rule for negation. Okay. What is this saying? It's saying, well, if you sort of run the sub-expression and get a number n, then the result for this will be the negative of that. And now I'm using a different font here for the negation. This is the, the mathy long font. And here I mean actual integer negation. Though really that's actually not very realistic if you think about it. Like you need like a, if someone wanted to implement this thing, they'd need like a big integer library or something. So maybe a more realistic thing, like if you're trying to define C, is that you'd, you wouldn't have like mathematical negation here. You'd have like negation on 32-bit integers or 64-bit integers. And so you, I don't know, you might, and maybe your n's don't, don't range over the integers, but maybe only the integers up to 2 to the 64 or something like that, okay? Or less than that, because you need the sign bit. Okay, all right, so that's the rule for negation. And then here, the rule for addition. Okay, the sub-expressions evaluate down to two numbers, and then we can go ahead and actually add the numbers to get the one result number uh, from that. Okay, and then here's a particular example of a program, of, of two of a program and a result that is in the relation, the eval relation. So this big program here evaluates to negative six. Okay, you can say with the i and the n. And Oh, those were just names for the rules. I was just labeling them so that we can refer to them later. Earlier I was using like one, two, and three. Think I for integer, N for negation, and P for plus. That's the mnemonic I had in my head. And I would have gone with longer names, but it, the slide was only so wide. Okay. Other questions about this example? Oh, and I should point out this. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. So you're. This is. So you're. You're asking why, or you're. What is your question? Is your. Are you asking? Is this a function, or you're saying it's? Why is it not a function, or? Yeah, so good question. So for everyone, is this a function? Right? Functions are a special class of relations, right? So is this thing a function? Is this relation also a function? No, no, I'm not talking I'm not talking about do do all big step semantics give you relations or function or functions. I'm just saying, you know, the question here on the table is whether this one, this one right here, the this eval relation, is this one a function? Yes. I, I claim that it is. Mm -hmm. There's only one thing you're allowed to do for each syntax element. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and in fact and you could do a, a proof and, and show that this is true. But what would be the domain of this function? First like we have to figure out the domain, right? Yeah, and the domain we could the domain will be a ref. The so uh, the domain is this set, which we called a riff, and the range is is z, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, this one is is indeed a function. Yeah, and actually, like, um, it actually slightly bugs me. So this notation, though, is very. Like it sort of like emphasizes that you're you're defining a relation and and whether it's a function or not is something you have to prove. Uh, and then like if you're using a proof assistant like Isabel or Koch, they've got they've got different uh, sort of facilities for defining relations and defining functions. And so if you kind of know ahead of time that what you're aiming for is a function, then sometimes you want to use that function facility instead of using the relation facility. And so for and uh, so for this particular language, 
I would actually encourage using the function facilities of those proof of systems and not the relation facilities. Um, and, and maybe in a paper, I might have even, instead of wanted, I might have wanted to write this more in a, in a function style. And I was even going to include it in the slides, which I'll prove to you now. But I, I then deleted this or moved the slide uh, to the junk pile at the end. Uh, because it's, it's harder to explain why this is also an example of definition by rules, okay? And we would have to talk a little bit about termination and some other things, which is not super hard, but it wasn't exactly something I wanted to talk about. But, but that's a thing that you can, you can do. Um, very good, yes. Assuming we're inheriting those uh, operations from the integer states, yes. but because they're not defined semantically here, the relationship between them. Right. So, okay. right. So, just let me. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We're just saying good old mathematical integer additions negation is what we're what we mean here. But if we couldn't assume that from the integer space, would we be able to tell from these? You wouldn't. You would never want to assume. You would want to contact the the language author. No, I, I get that. I'm saying. And if you're the language author, you would want to write it down. Or the first time someone asked you, you should write it down. So, sorry, I mean. Uh, I just meant if, for like some hypothet like, hypothetically, if we could not assume how uh -huh. those operators were, would we be able, with these rules alone, to, to determine whether or not it was a function? You could say almost nothing about this okay. language. Okay, understood. Yeah. Good. That's, uh, that's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no, part about. Part of sort of the way we do things in PL theory and trying to be precise is really being exhaustive about really defining everything. Um, so, but those oftentimes certain things are just understood about how we define things. And so, like in most papers, like if you've got any kind of stuff with integers going on, it's just assume that it's the mathematical integers, even though, like I was just joking around about needing big ints to implement this thing without, you know, even though that's not a realistic language thing to do, but it's well known how to deal with 32-bit integers and stuff like that. So we usually don't worry about that in PL theory. But yeah, you do, you really do want everything to be defined. Yeah. And, and that, and that would definitely make a difference as to what, what everything means. So here is a, right, so I, I, just a second ago, I claimed that this program here evaluates to minus six. And what if you called my bluff? And you said, oh yeah, prove it. Okay, so we need to build a derivation of that. Okay, so here's a derivation that this big expression here evaluates to minus six. And what's going on here is I'm very carefully sort of like picking out like the topmost operator precedence wise. So this is like a plus operator. And so the one child is the thing with the negative sign on the front and the other child is a four. Four goes straight to four. And then over here, the topmost thing is a negation. So this is a negation rule. I'm going from 10 to minus 10, right? And then the sub thing is three plus seven. And then, uh, then you've got three and seven, of course, at the leaves there, okay? So that's a derivation. And the way to think about these derivations is that, um, that this is like a trace of the execution in some sense of like what happened at runtime. Like your computer, and this captures the whole thing, the whole history of what happened inside the computer as it was like crunching along on your program. Okay? That's one way to think about, about this, these derivations in your operational semantics. If we had function call in this language, you would see the entire sort of procedure call stack sort of trace in the, in the derivation, okay? Okay, all right, let's move on to small step semantics, okay? Again, we're gonna use a relation. This time, it's a relation not between a rith and, and the result z, like before. Now it's a rith and another a expression, okay? So it's a program and program. 
we're not going all the way to the result in one big step. Instead, we're just doing one little tiny computation at a time. Okay? So we're going to sort of reach into a program, find one little piece of work to do, and do that <coughs> computational work, but then leave everything else the same. And so we still have this textual program sitting there. Okay? Um, right? So here, this step relation goes, you know, for, and then we're going to have this arrow notation for taking a step. Okay? <coughs> All right, so let's now look at the rules. These first two rules are the important ones. They're the, the ones that actually do some computation. So here, this negation rule says, okay, if you have negation, that's the dark textual negation sitting there with a, with a number inside, okay, you're ready to fire off that negation and turn it into and actually do the negation, okay? And so that's the mathematical thing being performed over there on the on the number, okay? Yeah. Don't you end up having a mix of uh, program and value? Value. Yes. Yes, and that's a that's actually a really important insight. Uh, that when you're doing small step semantics, your values better be a subset of your expressions. Otherwise, you know, your sort of types won't work out, okay? I mean, your, the, your, your relation won't make any sense. Whereas in big step semantics, your values don't have to be a subset of your expressions, okay? They can be sort of this other class of things. Now, in a Rith, you know, we included the integers as a subset of the expressions, and so it works either way for both small step and for big step. But there's definitely situations where, where you might be, like if you're doing big step, you might be tempted to have values that are not expressions. For example, in the lambda calculus, you might have these things called closures, okay, which are not expressions. They're, they're these special things that only pop up at runtime. And, and so then you, know, that would, you do that with big step semantics. But for small step semantics, you can't do closures. You have to do something else. Okay? Uh, okay, all right, so that's negation there. Oh, no. Oh, wait, no, that's not. Oh, that was this negation there, right? The, the, the dark TT font negation turning into mathematical negation. And then over here we have the, the dark, uh, you know, symbolic addition turning into actually doing the addition on the two numbers. Okay? So that's where the real computation happens. These rules down here, N1, P1, and P2, these are rules that let you sort of dive down into a program to find where the computation should happen and then sort of copy over all the stuff that stayed the same. Okay? So let's say I have um, this sort of chunk of my program that has a symbolic negative at the top. Well, if I can go inside and do a computation somewhere inside, and turn that into an E prime, then I can put this whole thing back together with a symbolic negative on top. Okay. And then for addition, there's two cases here. One is that I could go and find some work to do down inside of E1, and then I just copy over E2. Right? Or, and here, here, you know, we're saying, oh, if you can find some work down in E2, go ahead and do that. <coughs> And I've, I've sort of forced an evaluation order here by, by, in this rule, saying that you only do P2 if the first thing is already a number. Okay, so I forced an evaluation order, okay, by, by putting N there. Okay. I, I, as a language designer, made that choice. I could have made a different choice as a language designer about that. Any questions? So uh, we use basically the same notation for the small step and the big step semantics. You kind of tell by looking at it which one it is. Well, it really, it really, you have to kind of, you know, the if you're reading a PL paper, people may very well use whatever symbols they feel like. Okay, but there are some common trends. 
that people oftentimes use a, an arrow with a sort of a double line when they're talking about big step. Uh, and usually, oftentimes, the big step is either down or to the right. And it's usually a short arrow. These are just conventions. Yeah. And so I was trying to you know, stick to the conventions and, and whatnot with these slides. And then these long, and then you'd, you'd never use a down arrow for a small step. This long arrow is, is maybe the most traditional. This is Matthias Fleisen, his notation. And so a lot of people use that notation. Uh, sometimes you'll see a squiggly line for small step or a hooked line sometimes. Uh, but this is probably the most prevalent. And also, I mean, the, the book, I will have a link to this book at the end, but there's a book, Types and Programming Languages, which is probably the most sort of, like most grad students in programming languages will read that book and then go with the notation from that book. So. Benjamin Pierce's book, yeah. Yep. Well, there's a link to that in the slides as well. Okay. Okay, so this small step, you know, the, the way this sort of works for a program evaluation is going to be a lot different. So, for example, here's, here's a little example program. And the pair, this, pro, this expression and that expression is in the step relation. Okay, and by chaining together these, what I'm, that's just shorthand for saying this pair is in the relation, so is this, this pair is also in the step relation, and then this pair as well is in the step relation. I'm just sort of chaining them together, okay? And so what's going on here, right? Well, I'm reaching down inside, diving down, past this plus, past this negation, down to three plus seven, and here I'm at a place where the P rule can fire. Okay, and I can replace that with a 10, and then these other rules are also getting used to put back the negation and the 4, the plus 4. Okay? And then now this negative 10 can get actually turned into a negative 10. Right? And then I can, now I've got two numbers and a plus, and I can finally do the, do the plus. Yes? Yes. So suppose instead of using the as our expression that we're using lambda. Lambda calculus? Lambda mm -hmm. calculus for mm -hmm. and we also can, is that how you can have two different rules to express one called value and called value? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you can use that kind of stuff to control that. Absolutely. And it, it can be articulated in small steps. Yes. Okay. Yep. Like for like let's say you want to call by value, what would you do? There'd be that beta rule. You'd you'd instead of having the argument be any old expression, you'd require that the argument be a value, and you'd have a grammar for your values. And yeah. Okay. Let's. I think I've got a derivation in here. Yes. So here is a derivation of just of, of just one of the that very first step. Okay, so every one of those steps has a, has a derivation for it. Okay, so here's that step where we went from 3 plus 7 to 10. Okay, and so what we had to do is we had to use that P1 rule that says, oh, go look on the left hand side uh, for something to do. And then, and then on the left hand side, there wasn't anything directly to do, so then we used the the N1 rule to say go inside the negation, and then finally we were at 3 plus 7, and we were able to use the P rule to, to go to 10. And then if you're sort of looking on the right-hand side over here, you can see the rule sort of building the expression back up again. Okay. And if you're an efficiency-minded programmer, you might be going, oh my god, this is horrific. Uh, yeah, you'd never implement this directly. Like, do not write an interpreter as if it was a small step semantics, OK? <laughs> this is just about specifying the behavior of your languages. And then implementation would, would look a lot different, OK? So, and some people get a little confused. Sometimes they think, oh, I'm going to make my specification better by making it more efficient. And, and when, I'm, when someone says something like that, I'm like, huh? 
Like that's sort of like, that's not a good pro, you don't need that, that property for your specification. What your specification should be is easy to understand. That's the, really the main thing that matters. Is it precise and easy to understand, okay? And, you know, how big the derivations are is, I mean, you just do proofs about these things, you don't actually build them, so, so that doesn't matter. Okay. Small step semantics are definitely kind of, when I, when I first learned about them, it definitely was sort of a, this, a weird sort of model of computation for me. You know, I was used to living in GDB and debuggers and stuff like that, and it, it's a very different feel to it. Uh, whereas the big step seemed a bit more, more natural. Yeah. Because we have a relation in this spot to, mm -hmm. um, we have an expression, multiple rules to apply for mm. different expressions. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a separate precedence? Or, or maybe, I think maybe you're hinting at, is, is this thing a function? Is this relation actually a function? Uh, that's a great question. So here, because of, I think because I, I put that restriction in there, I think that this relation is in fact a function, okay, though I haven't checked it. Sometimes people also say like, is your small step semantics deterministic, okay? Um, they don't have to be, okay? So for example, like the classic lambda calculus is not, you know, it is a relation and, and not a function, okay? And then you start to ask like, well, what happens if you go down sort of two separate paths? And in the lambda calculus, things are confluent, so you can always get back to the same spot. Um, uh, and, but things do get harder to think about when, when you can take separate paths. And then sometimes your language, you really want that non-determinism. You want non-determinism. Let's say you're doing multi-threading or something. You've got a language that can fork and join in, right? So you can have race conditions and all kinds of exciting things like that that cause your program to do different things when you run it twice. So, great, great question. Any other questions about the small step semantics? Could you just talk a little bit more about the difference between the example and the derivation? All right, so on the next slide, I show the derivation of just this first step. Oh, okay. And then I would have to show you another derivation. So the way I think about it is that like if we sort of if we sort of like zoom back a little bit and like our small step is like you've got a program I'm just representing it with a dot and you've got another program it's a dot so I've got all these small steps happening and then for every one of these edges here every step there's a whole derivation sort of justifying that one little step okay does that help Whereas with the big step semantics, there, you know, you just went directly from there to there with maybe a, a bigger tree <laughs> for, just, for all in one go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you always derive a big steps and uh, rules from any given small steps? Ah. Uh, That's a great question. Um, Usually, so in a lot of cases you can, and, and it's a fairly systematic, there's a sort of systematic ways of doing it. In fact, there's a, um, there's a bunch of research on this. Um, oh my gosh, it's one of my friends. What's his name? Uh, he's from Denmark. Oh, it's called this, it's this functional, Oh man, he used to do continue a lot of stuff about continuations, uh, and so a lot of he knew a lot of the older people at Indiana University. I'm blanking on his name. Oh, I just had dinner with him last year. It was so bad. Uh, Olivier Dombey. Okay, so Olivier Dombey has this long series of papers about probably about 10 papers or so about, uh, about a sort of a recipe he has for going back and forth between small step and big step and even other styles of semantics. Uh, now your question had an all for all quantifier on it and uh, I'm, 
uh, yeah, I don't know about every possible one, but he showed it worked for a lot of semantics. Um, so that, that's some pretty cool stuff to look at. So Olivier Danvi, I'm a big fan of his work. Um, all right, time for an, another exercise. I think this might be our last exercise before we have a, another 15 minutes. So, so we're going to be back to the arith pair language. So extend the big step semantics. Oh, I'm sorry. First define what your values are. Like when you run one of these arith pair programs, what kind of values should you get out at the end? Okay. Then extend the big step semantics to handle arith pair. Okay, so you've already got the rules for arithmetic. You need to add in rules for the pair operations. There's three of them. No, there's two of them. Okay. Right, this is the language, right? We've got, we need to define what these two things do. And, um, and then also a small step semantics that handles uh, these rules. Okay. So I have a feeling we may just have time for the big step semantics. Or, or do whichever one you feel, you know, strikes your fancy, okay? Let's do like five. Yeah, let's do four minutes. Go for it. Yeah, well, I mean, okay, if, if you want to go do it differently, that's fine. But if you want to live dangerously, you know, use the E. <laughs> Either way, I'm, I'm okay with it. You get to write the rules. You get to write the rules. <laughs> so if we want to ban something, be like undefined behavior, do you normally just not write the justification step? Yeah, you just don't put a rule. And then the person's like, I have undefined behavior. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay, what if I want to specifically disallow something? If you what? Can I specifically disallow things with this kind of... So... It depends what you mean by disallow. So if you want, let's say, for example, you want a runtime exception, then you need to define what runtime exceptions, how those things work, what are they. You need to write a bunch of rules for, for runtime exceptions. So, I mean, and then if you want to disallow it at compile time, right, then you need to put in typing rules that, that disallow it. So that's a great question. All right, does anyone have, let's... Um, does anyone have a big step semantics for pairs? Brave soul. Uh, I think I've not called on you yet. Yeah. Um, so, uh, all the rules or only the, the first? Just give me uh, rules for these. So uh, let's say if E1 evaluates to X. Uh oh, X. That's a. That's a meta variable that we haven't okay, so decided on using yet. N. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, so you're saying it's an, it has to be an integer. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, you know what? We're getting ahead of ourselves. The, um, right? What was my, what is your, val what are your values? Yeah, that's the question that you didn't answer. <laughs> 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 Not a naughty. Okay, hold, let's hold that thought. And did someone have a de definition of values? So I, this hand went up I quickly. Think, I would think Z cross Z, right? So, so you're saying, and, and I could equivalently say that my values are, look like that, right? That's what you just said, Z cross Z. But, yeah, so that was a good first, first step, but, but that's not right. Yeah, you could have pairs inside of pairs, right? So we don't want n's here. What do we want? V's. Okay. Can, are there any other kinds of values? Just the natural numbers. Yeah. Okay. So our values are also recursive, and we typically use grammars to describe the values as well. They're there. We just added them. Wait, natural numbers. Mm, wait. Okay. 
I remember way, way back when in the slides I said that n ranges over integers. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Um, that's a, that's, uh, yes, yesterday they were all natural numbers. <laughs> sorry. Oh, and I, I was going to use i's earlier today, but then I switched them all to n's because there's a chance that I could confuse myself because n is typically used for both, actually. So. Okay, good question. So you're asking, could I, instead of having v comma v, could I just do e comma e? That's a great question. Does anyone have uh, a thought about that? Take your hand first. I kind of want things to be in normal form. Like I don't want x, I don't want two plus three to be the answer of my program evaluation. Right. And so I want my values to be things which cannot be reduced further. Yes. Right. So values should not be further reducible. Like they're done. Right. And so. Whereas E can have things that still have lots of work to do in them. So yes, you're right. And then the technical term for that is a normal form. Uh, it sort of means no longer reducible. Yep. OK, good. So now we have our values okay, defined. Good. It's always, it's really important. I mean, that's a crucial step. I mean, you can now realize how, how crucial that was. OK, so now going back to here. And actually, one thing about these rules is oftentimes it's good to, to start on the bottom left when you're writing them down. So what's your bottom left-hand side look like? Uh, E1, E2. E1, comma, E2. Right, good. And then we're going to work clockwise <laughs> through this rule, OK? OK, so now E1, it's not going to go to an, a number necessarily. Uh, V1. Let's call it V1, OK? V2, okay. And then the pair goes to V1, V2. V1, V2, okay. And we should, and this thing better be a value, right? Because this is a relation between arith and values. And indeed, well, recursively, we know that these things are values. And then, and then we fit into this grammar, so good. OK, so we've got the first rule down. OK, maybe let's go to someone else for uh, another rule. Was uh, with the pencil there? Um, yep. Sure. So, the yes, that'd be awesome. Ah, OK. E1 comma e2 subscript 0 goes to v1 okay all right so this is this is wrong but it's great because I'm sure lots of other people uh, maybe were thinking of something like this, OK? And kind of what's going on here is you're sort of mixing the work that this rule did with the work of subscripting. And furthermore, this rule, there's programs that you want to subscript that this one doesn't handle, OK? For example, I had, I had one up there before. But, but you could have. Um, so you could have like multiple subscripts. Like you could have a pair of a pair of a pair of a pair. And then you could be like 0 of 1 of 0 of 1. Right? So the thing inside the subscript doesn't have to be literally a pair. In fact, our grammar just says that you can have an arbitrary expression there. Right? Like another subscript expression. So for example, uh, uh, yeah, let me just go back to that program I had at the very beginning. Oh, no, I went too far. All right, it was the exercise. Here we go. OK, cool. Um, yeah, look at this 0 and then 1, right? The thing, I don't know if you can see this, but the thing inside the zero here, that sub-expression is not a, 
not literally a pair expression. It's another subscript expression, right? Because so here we have a pair, and here we have a pair, but then we subscript it, and then we subscript it again, right? So you can so you, so, and maybe the rule of thumb here to follow when you're defining these rules and actually making if let's say you want to get a, uh, a you want to you want your big step to actually be a function and be deterministic, then you should have one rule per syntax. And you should just take the syntax here and stick it in the bottom left hand corner. And then you're sort of, you'll know that you'll cover all your cases, right? And that's the problem with this sort of, by mixing the subscripting and the pair notation together, we're actually sort of forgetting cases that we needed to, to do, okay? It's a lot like writing, if you've ever written a recursive function, you know, you might have been tempted to sort of do more work than you should and like look at the children of your current node in your recursive function. This is exactly the same issue, okay? And so, so instead, we want to do like just E0 here, okay? Um, let's actually, for a second, let's just pretend that we had E0 here and maybe E1 there, okay? And then now that we've got these two different grammar rules, then we'd have another rule that goes E1 goes to V2. Okay. Sorry, I don't understand the derivation rule right there. The line, right? Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm really sorry. Oh, I, I left, I left off. I, I kept the stuff he had there before. You're absolutely right. This is bogus. We have to fix, right? So E, we need to evaluate E. And if we're going to subscript it, it better come out to be a pair, right? V1 comma V2. And now that's all good. And then in this case down here, we again have E going to V1 comma V2. Thank you. I, in my head, I'd already fixed it, but the blackboard had garbage. Does that essentially mean that we don't have to find behavior for if uh, E evaluates to? Correct. And technically, what would happen is you, you just wouldn't be able to build a derivation. There would be no derivation in that scenario. Yep. And that would typically, when you can't build a derivation for a big step program, that means Usually one of two things, either you got undefined behavior or you had non-termination. This language is too simple for non-termination, but question. Uh, what, if you do, what happens if you do subscription one on a measure? Right, so, so your question is like, if you had 42 subscripted with one, is that, is that, you know, is there some value such that that is in the eval relation? Question mark. Does a V exist? And the answer is no. You cannot build a derivation for that. There's no such V. Uh, definition of the syntax is still correct. Yes. We could define another rule, though, that basically no subscripts are in that book though, right? Yeah, I mean, it's your, it's your language, so you could define something to happen. And it's actually, you want to be very specific about when you want something to be undefined mm -hmm. or, or when you want to define something <coughs> that else happens. That's a very conscious choice that you need to make. And if you want it to be undefined, then you sort of leave out, you know, you just don't say what's going to happen, right? And that usually corresponds to like a situation where the program could like seg fault or memory corruption or whatever, right? And so if you're defining like the C language, you'd have lots of situations where that happens. Or if you're like, let's say you're defining ML, you'd also have situations like that, except that all those programs that would have been undefined, that have undefined if you run them, the type system will throw them away. So let's actually, I only have, uh, I have very little time left. We're going to have to go, uh, but you've been asking such great questions. But let's just do a really quick type system, OK? A type system and I don't know, are you OK with hanging out? Well, if you want to leave for lunch, go ahead. I'll try to wrap up in like five minutes uh, for those that want to hang out for a little bit longer. My apologies. Uh, OK, so 
This is, yeah, you all have been itching for type systems, okay? <laughs> Maybe, ah, oh, that was good that I left it for last. Ha, ha, ha. Okay, all right, so let's extend our language with Booleans, okay? So now we've got integers and Booleans. Um, so we've got like, you know, Boolean operations like or and not. I, I forgot and, but it doesn't matter. Um, what is a type, right? A type classifies values. It's, it's grouping sets of values. Um, so for example, like here I'm saying int uh, is this set with all the integers in it, and um, bool is the set with true and false in it, okay? And what does a type system do? A type system typically has two goals in mind. One way of thinking about a type system that it's gonna predict what the result of the program is gonna be in terms of this classification, okay? So is the program gonna produce an int or is it gonna produce a bool? The type system will predict which one it's gonna be, right? So that first program, the type system is gonna say int. That one's gonna produce an int. And then the type system look at the second one and say, you know what, that one's a bool program, okay? It's gonna produce a bool. So there's this prediction element of what's going on. Also type systems can be think of, thought of as enforcers, okay? And what they're gonna enforce is that you never send a value of the wrong type into an operator, okay? And this is something that's been sort of bugging you all for almost the whole morning, right? So like there's an example, three plus false, right? Well, you all know languages where that actually works, but that's not my fault, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's famously said by Han Solo, right? Uh, right, and so the type system is gonna guarantee, is gonna say, you know what, that's a bad program. You should never be putting falses into your booleans into your integer arithmetic operations, okay? So the type systems are gonna rule out those programs that are gonna enforce that we only use the right kind of operations with the, with the various, or the right kind of values with the operations, okay? And we already talked a little bit about this, right? That uh, programs can go wrong, like if you don't have a type system, okay? So you're, in your big step semantics, you might have certain programs that just aren't in, a, in the evaluation relation. There's no value that they go to, right? And these are, so when, when you've got examples of these ill-typed programs, they just don't evaluate, right? And in the big step, that means you just don't have a big step. In the small step, it means you might very well be able to step for a while, but at some point you'll get stuck and you'll, you'll be at a program that can't do another step, that it's just not in that relation again, okay? Right, and so this is, we're trying to prevent programs that can go wrong, okay? So here is a type system for the arithbool language. Guess what? Definition by rules, third time's a charm, okay? So we're defining this, this relation called well-typed. It, it's it's on, on arithbool, expressions and types. And the types, you know, that's, the, that's just this int and bool. Those two symbols are, are what we use as types, okay? So this, and then what we're gonna define some uh, notation, this uh, funny sideways T thing, this turnstile in LaTeX, uh, or V dash actually. Uh, what is, where does turnstile come from? I forget. Um, so if you have a turnstile and then an expression and then a colon and then a type, that's going to be our notation for just a pair that's in the well-typed relation, okay? And so now we just have a whole bunch of rules that says, okay, an integer, that's, we're going to label that as an int. For negation, well, the sub-expression better be an integer, and then we'll produce an integer. Same with addition. True and false are bools. Negation, you better have a bool coming in and you produce a bool, or is a similar kind of situation. If is kind of interesting. Does anyone want to try to read that rule for me? What does that mean? Yeah. So it's saying if expression one is a bool, and expression two and expression three both have the same type T, then if E1, then E2, else E3, Exactly right. That's perfect. Yep. So when you see the same variable being used in two places, right, that's asserting equality. And like if you're writing an interpreter for this language, you would have to, you know, put like a function call to your equal, type equality checker, right? 
Or if you're in a dependently typed language, you'd have a whole bunch of work to do to implement that equality check. Okay. So that's it. That's a type system. Uh, definition by rules, yet again, third time. Okay. And then there's various formulations of type safety. This one is a particularly simple one. Uh, this one doesn't quite generalize. You probably need to go read my blog post if you've got a language that can, can go into infinite loops. You have to tweak how you do type safety. But for a nice terminating language, this is one, this is, you can say it this way, which is just saying if you've got a well-typed program of type T, then it's going to go, it's going to evaluate to a value, and that value will have type T as expected. Mm -hmm. Is it the only non term change you need to make for non termination to say, like, if, if he is T and uh, he evaluates to V, then V is T? That's a great question. By making, so what he just did was move this from the conclusion into the premise. Okay, making that move weakens your type safety statement because now it's saying cause it no longer captures the you don't get stuck thing because now what you're saying is if you're well typed and if you don't get stuck, then you'll get a thing that's the right type, which is a much weaker statement. It doesn't enforce that, uh, it doesn't do the, you know, prevent the getting stuck aspect or the undefinedness part, okay? But um, there's a couple ways to do this. If you switch this over to a small step formulation, you can get around that problem. Or you can also um, add sort of an integer counter that you can think of as fuel and, and then say um, um, that, and then when you run out of fuel, you, you sort of do a timeout. And then you say, like, for all n, you know, you get, you get either a timeout or you actually get a value back. And that, that works as well, okay? Even for non programs that could non-terminate, right? Uh, that's in, I've got a blog post about that. It's called Big Step Diverging or Stuck. Um, uh, I've got a link to it here at the end. Actually, maybe well, let's just go ahead and I'm definitely not going to have time to do the actual proof here or that. Um, that, but let's just finish it off with here's some suggested reading, right? That you know, you've got access to the slides on the workshop instruction Google Doc, so you can get your slides and get this, this suggested reading. It includes, right, the link to my blog post, uh, some books that I recommend. The, the types and programming languages, one from Pierce, uses uh, small step semantics throughout the whole thing. Um, and that is the, sort of the dominant way of doing things, so that's, that's good. Uh, I also like the semantic engineering book because it, has, it also shows you what abstract machines look like, and those are also quite useful for, for many purposes. Um, and then my blog post has, has lots of more sort of answers to some of these fun questions. Uh, and then uh, there's also, these are some of the two main conferences that you might be interested in. Uh, there's, there's more ACM conferences on programming languages, but this ICFP one is specifically about functional programming, and then Popol also has a lot of uh, functional programming in it as well. Uh, this, though this one might sometimes lean more mathy side of things, but, but they're both uh, great conferences. So, great. Any last questions? Or? Yeah. Um, where do you think the, uh, the, the current state of programming how is it? Where's the attention? Um, so, I guess if I, so one of the, I think the cooler things that's happening, I mean, maybe I'll point to tech transfer, uh, but then point to some of the things that's happened sort of that fed into that. So like this Rust language that you've been hearing about, it's like the systems programming sort of fairly low level language, but it's also safe. And this is a combination that really hasn't been done before. And the reason why it hasn't been done before is that it's hard. And you need a lot of like fancy type system research to make it happen. And so all that research happened you know, throughout the, the 90s and 2000s and whatnot. And then it, 
finally, sort of, it got to the point where the the people, you know, peop the people involved with the Rust team were like, okay, cool, like we can, we think we can do this. Like enough of the research been done, let's go ahead and do low level and safe at the same time. So that's that's uh, a pretty cool development. Um, the thing that I work on a lot is gradual typing, uh, where you're mixing uh, a statically part of your program is statically typed and part of it's dynamically typed. So uh, in industry, there's like the TypeScript language and there's Flow and Hack and all these things. And so we've been doing a lot of research about how to make those kind of systems work better, uh, make them more sound and predictable and get the efficiency and things like that. And that's, that's been a pretty hot topic over the last 10 years as well. What's that? Um, so efficiency was a big one. So like in just two years ago, there was a paper at Popple that said sound gradual typing or is sound gradual typing dead? And they had this implementation that on some programs would be like a thousand times slower if you were sort of being good about checking values that flowed back and forth between dynamic and static regions and making sure that the values that flowed into your statically typed region actually have the right type. You know, you don't want strings masquerading as integers, but if you're coming from dynamic land, that could happen, right? So you need a sort of a border guard. So there is the actual type checking going on. Yeah, at runtime at the border. And so um, my answer to that question is no, it's not dead. Uh, and there's a lot of cool research being done like right now and hopefully like being published. Well, just last year's Uppsala conference, that's another one of the big ACM conferences had basically three papers all saying, no, it's not dead, and here's how we get efficiency. And then I'm hoping to have another paper come out, uh, this com coming Uppsala, actually, uh, that also shows another approach to making things efficient. Um, I like the idea of not having border guard just as a special punishment for people who are not typing. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you should have added more types. <laughs> Yeah, and the problem is that sometimes the people that added the types suffer for the for the other person's sins. So <laughs> it's their fault, but but it, they might you know, but the error might happen when you run the program, even though you're being good. And so that's the the nice thing about the border guard thing is that it means that at least it'll fail at the border, and then you it's easy to know who to blame. And we have this whole thing called blame tracking that we do to, to make it easy to know who to blame. <laughs> so, yeah. Good. All right. Well, thank you very much.